I just want to also uh, thank um, um, uh, um, one of our coordinator, Jessica Liu, who joined just slightly late, one of the speakers who helped me to produce this poster. Uh, we admittedly uh, produced this very last minute for six um, hours of uh, collaborative work through Zoom. And, um, and uh, the images we have produced is a montage, uh, which is also praised um, or uh, kind of um, got a positive comments on it's um, quite um, a suitable aesthetic for the time that we are uh, currently uh, in, which is a time of uncertainty um, after pandemic. And uh, it looked like somebody said it, it looked like a very dystopian Meeting down situations, and then we still are trying to hold this uh, forums um, um, to be able to share knowledges and and come up with um, ideas um, uh, together um, uh, among ourselves as well as uh, global um, uh, public, and. I also have obligation to mention that what is um, um, uh, Asia Global Cultural Studies Forum, and um, which is important statement, uh, even if we have limited number of participants and, um, and or not, uh, we try to grow this uh, space for all of us, and we do not uh, support any form of ethnocentric or regional chauvinism or hegemonic nationalism on for our future. Uh, our vision for the future. And uh, also it solely focuses on promoting cosmopolitan learning and exploration of culture uh, um, combined with a much directional um, decolonization as our, our task. Um, simultaneously, uh, our forum supports emergence of other cosmopolitan research group and for at OCAD and beyond, um, which um, uh, hopefully share the similar and parallel non-hierarchical and non-exclusionary notion of regional, national, ethnic, and cultural identities. Um, I also want to thank that um, our coordinators uh, in advance for Site Forum and Marie Suagawara uh, joined us, um, um, uh, IAMD students and artists and writer, and Kathy Wang, Leon Hu, and Jessica Liu, uh, the, some of the founding member of, of this forum or also have been working as a coordinator. And discussant um, um, uh, who joined the designated discussant, again, they are immersed. Um, we use the uh, model of immersed uh, uh, discussant um, um, uh, uh, model. And Jin Young Kim, uh, who is a lecturer and at uh, Concordia University currently joining from Montreal. And Lex um, uh, Bergon, uh, who is also a uh, graduate of Visual and Critical Studies, and who are also, both of them are supporter and witness of Asia Global Cultural Studies Forum and will be future presenters as well. Um, currently, I kill the screens. And so I, Jin Young Kim, can you wave hands? But if you are, you, your video is on. And I can't see it because I'm looking at my screen right now. Lex, if you have already arrived, could you wave your hands? And if your video is on. I assume yeah. that you waved your hands. Um, this is my opening remarks, which I prepared, which I didn't mean to go on um, uh, to be a length. Um, and the title I have created this is for um, to remind us uh, what kind of circumstances we are um, to launch this first uh, online forum in an era of global pandemic and also continuing violences. So this is like uh, my little um, note that I have prepared um, and please forgive me that um, after I spending too much time helping uh, my um, students um, polishing their <laughs> presentation files, I was very satisfied and I was slightly precautionating my own presentation um, files so it is not as uh, pretty. So I'm, while I'm doing this, I'm admitting people to come in as well. And um, it is um, um, kind of uh, still hard to believe uh, that um, I never expected that um, I will uh, encounter a situation like pandemic where uh, entire city or nation has been locked down and the university where I'm working at also closed down 
uh, in the mid February and uh, we have been in home, home isolation situation. We all stuck here basically. And um, what we remember is, let's say in history, um, 1917 Spanish flu or something, and which we learned from the history book, but never imagined that this is, will be the situation that I will encounter and, um, uh, and, and live the, to live with. So therefore the original um, forum that's scheduled for um, May uh, 12 was canceled um, because the pandemic and university closing down happened, uh, I think late March or mid March. And uh, so then I was quite frustrated about many things. And also the situation itself is very dystopian. And so I was quite de depressed like many other people or intellectual like me also to a certain degree. And, but it was students who encouraged me to uh, launch an online forum. And I really thank for their encouragement and also the learning processes, how to use this type of, of platform like Zoom and finally, I'm ready to accept what we call new normal. And so um, after um, uh, months of preparation uh, processes to launch this forum in online through using Zoom, um, this is actually a um, uh, um, conference or a forum uh, in distance. We do not interact with each other um, uh, personally. Yet I found it's quite um, exciting because it gives a greater accessibility uh, for everyone. And I believe that among those who informed me, we have uh, guests or attendee joining from Tokyo, Japan, as well as uh, um, Manchester, UK, and uh, Seoul, South Korea, and many different places in the world right now. If it was a physical uh, forum, um, those participation would not been, have been possible. And also want to remind you that we have a special lecture that designated by me about this pandemic situation and what other maybe uh, close observations and readings I, I have been doing as I am just born researchers and a lot of interesting points to take um, uh, witnessing the different responses of different culture. And, um, and I have, uh, again, a slide for uh, that, which is not uh, quite polished, but it will be sufficient to convey my points. Uh, in terms of violence, um, uh, um, I just want to remind us uh, that we are living in a very disturbing age where there is a uh, uh, man whose name George Floyd um, 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 died uh, by through the police violence, and which again sparked um, huge rage and protest despite all uh, state of emergency situation where everyone is supposed to be segregated and keeping social distancing. Um, thousands of people took the streets and of course there's clear evidence of racism and also ethnocentric hierarchies um, uh, that exist in our society in North America and elsewhere and that's just a fertile ground for uh, ubiquitous and perpetual violence. Of course, those of us slightly older or have taken classes, we remember Lord King was a uh, case was the huge issues. But of course, there's a lot of other killings, a random uh, uh, unjust killings that we have experienced and a lot of aggressive form of racism and invisible um, um, passive form of racism, uh, racism has been experienced and witnessed everywhere. But we're not just talking about racism in the North American context um, and the era of, uh, through the um, context of era of violence. I'm also wanna, um, I want to talk about uh, the recent news on authoritarian inter-Asian measures and national uh, security law, which has been used by uh, CCP China over Hong Kong. Um, one of the biggest news we have seen last year in Asian and Asia global context was bloodshed protest of Hong Kong citizens against authoritarian measures and, and oppressions. So the, my question is, um, again, the individual, maybe um, our papers, the researchers, um, analysis and observations uh, can be, of course, presented in the future through this forum. But I will just uh, leave that issue with questioning 
um, as a scholar of, of democratization in Asia and as an activist, a former activist and act, still an activist of uh, anti-authoritarianism, uh, is democratic and non-authoritarian and non-hierarchical and decolonized, decolonized governance in East Asia possible. Um, I'm speaking as also a scholar of Korean history whose population has been fighting, um, engaged in bloodshed fight and protest uh, for this um, more democratized, um, non-hierarchical society, which has gained a certain um, um, uh, victories. And, and we have some also uh, discussions on that issues. Um, through connecting uh, Taiwanese researchers currently working in Tokyo University in the global network of researcher section for the end of this uh, uh, forum. Anyways, um, on that note, I just want to remind us um, that how the, uh, um, this forum is a space for global learning and global awareness um, that we all need to gain uh, to see the connections of all these um, uh, events, uh, as well as that allows our reasoner actions and responsibility to be able to address and end uh, the era of, of violences. Um, my slide is not moving. Is it frozen? No. <laughs> so um, quickly, our um, we have a presentations of of um, many exciting researchers. Um, um, we have a two professor, as I mentioned um, earlier, that in terms of structure, we have a unique syncretic structure of forum. Um, um, the always we have a three tiers of presenter, students, professor, and professional. And we have um, two professors. This forum, Haruzi and myself and four students uh, in the program and also one professional. So it meets our criteria. It's always um, we um, aim to um, uh, make this space as a participatory forum means uh, presentation is uh, important and a discussion and uh, participated by discussant and audience are as important. So 15 minutes of presentation and 15 minutes of discussion are allotted for all of us. And so please enjoy and don't, sh don't be shy to um, join um, and share your thoughts and enrich our conversations. Or after this five hours of journey with the two breaks in the middle and 15 minutes break, as you can see, first round and second round, again, 15 minutes break. Um, uh, please make sure that you leave your name and uh, uh, affiliation or jobs or an email ad address um, in the chat box, perhaps, because this link seemingly not working as I thought. Anyways, uh, in the middle of the break and and the forum will be still, our uh, space will be open. I quickly will end temporarily uh, to save the, uh, our recording, but immediately you can enter again in the same room uh, without this continuity. So anyways, um, because I'm going to open the meeting uh, room again in the same link, please. And we're going to have also post forum, Hari, virt I call it post forum virtual GM, and which simulates perhaps the post forum parties that we always like to have, where we can have an open chat, casual ones, eat together, bring your coffee or dinner and share it in front of um, your um, screens. And that's basically it. Sorry about my extended, somebody could have stopped. Anyways, thank you very much. Um, stop sharing. Um, I think we haven't decided who want to introduce the first speaker. So uh, why don't uh, Kathy uh, do that, please? Thank you. <clears throat> oh, so the first speaker will be Professor uh, Haruji. Um, she is a professor of DPXA and Digital Futures in OCAD. Her presentation will be on artificial nature and what's current. So, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. So um, mm -hmm. I will share my screen. Yes. Is, um, is it right? Share. So can you see my screen? Yep. Yep. 
Uh, I think I have a, again a trouble that I can't see you. <laughs> so that um, I can't see any of you. So if uh, um, there's something like to tell me, then just please, um, just please speak to me. So um, thank you for having me today. Um, that uh, today I'll talk about my research creation, artificial nature, and Andres Coronte is one of on artificial nature project. But today I will um, bring like a, at least like a four um, artificial natures to show why um, mostly, uh, hopefully like I can deliver why I'm doing this um, research creation and then what are attributes and then how it can contribute. And then hopefully I can kind of meet the uh, context like expanded context of this forum. So, um, oh, sorry. So here, um, in the simplest definition, um, artificial nature is a life, artificial life world making. So uh, you can see here is the world. And then once we see the world, then we can recognize very easily where is its center. Because probably it's more resourceful, more it, they, they, it has more order, or it's more elaborated or established, or just easy to recognizable. And then we uh, have the tendency to come to the center because probably it's visible, uh, it's uh, uh, most visible. But um, as an artist, what I'm concerning is, um, what I'm concerned, like what I concern is the most is that this behavior might make the world actually to get smaller. And then like our common experience of growing older, like you could remember that the world around you uh, used to be smaller. I mean, it was bigger when you were um, younger, but now it became like smaller. And that's, I can say, um, I, it's a, the common experience. So that what I see the world Actually, the world is infinite, isn't it? So it, it, it isn't small. So what I'm interested in is to look to the edges of the world and to expand it. So, um, so that like it can actually make the world bigger. Or like other, actually, honestly, what I see is that when we grow older, that we understand because of um, our filter, we see the world smaller. So actually we have this obligation or duty or the, the survivor instinct to make the world not get smaller. So it's more like maintaining its infinity scale as the infinity. Um, so the, here that these boundary areas are um, as an artist where I'm interested in. And then I can describe its characteristics as like, there are more like unknown things. And then it's more heterogeneous, just by nature, it's more diverse. And there can be like a more chaotic um, order and disorder. And um, that what we could imagine is like a liminal zones or coastal ecologies. And then what I try to do is that like to seed those words and then make many other words and then um, that's what I try to, so um, I assert that uh, my research creation is like a, a word out of, like it's a kind of imitating or uh, it kind of came out from, as a seed of our own world. And then, and everyone could make many words. And then um, I think that, that that would make the world more vibrant. So now you can see once, once there are many words, still like we can see the centers. But uh, I think the most, uh, Dangerous thing is one center to look, uh, to look, but many centers. I think I, I think it's healthy. So um, through this expanding of the world, um, this question, how can you know what we don't know, became very important to me. Um, especially um, these days, our tools became really mighty, um, but surely that doesn't mean we are mighty. However, it's easy, easy to be arrogant that but still um and then like that that ignorance or that that arrogance kind of is to make us to forget the vastness of what we don't know 
So I want to remind that uh, question. And then this question um, is the real greater than the possible. I, I have been asking this question each time whenever I meet um, like the um, audiences, visitors, participants. And then it was really interesting to hear that, that people have different answers. Like the real is greater or the possible is the greater or the possible or the imaginable. Uh, for me, the real is greater. The reason is that I, I put the unknown into the real instead to the imaginable or to the, to the possible. So the real as the sum of the known, uh, the known and the unknown, and it's, it's vast. And then that's uh, my stance when I approach to um, the, my research creation. So um, the artificial nature. So this is um, um, the kind of short, another like short form of uh, definition. Since 2007, as a collaborative project um, that with the Graham Wakefield, um, we, do, we have pursued this trajectory, uh, kind of knowing, um, like recognizing the unknown by creating a family of artificial natures. Interactive art installations surrounding humans with uh, biologically inspired complex systems experienced in immersive mixed reality. The invitation is to become another part of an alien ecosystem rich in living feedback networks, just like our world, but not as its central subject. Um, so here you can see some selective artificial nature projects. And I'll talk about a few, like um, I think four um, of these works to, to explore the themes in depth. So first, um, the attribute that, um, so all artificial nature artworks are interactive system art and especially focusing on infinite feedback. So first the sound, I will let you hear some sound and then I'll make the sound lower. And then this sound um, that what you are seeing the, the video and hope that there's no the lagging or um, you can you can see the, the video and it's a little bit smaller and you can see it and then now you see that there are bitter kind of species at the left um, the video and when they um, they can survive only there are energy particles and if when they eat energy particles and when they um, propagate they need uh, they time to time they exchange their genes and when they exchange their genes, they make a sound. So the, those um, sound was the sound of those uh, little agents. And then the other, um, the time of doubles realized the coexistence of multiple doubles in mirrored worlds in which organisms grow and adapt to an environment in part shaped by you. So when your body influences currents of the wind while your virtual self is consumed by create, uh, creatures, and so you became sun to give them the energy and then you are taking the role in the virtual world. And here uh, also you can see a little diagram and then the diagram shows that the, uh, the infinite feedback loop. So everything is linked and then continuously, there is no dead end. So um. I think that um, I heard from Professor Bach that um, it's better to finish the, the, or the talk in 25 minutes, so I will a little bit hurry. So there are actually many interesting ideas in terms of uh, uh, as an interactive uh, system, system. Uh, but um, that I will go um, in depth if there are more questions later, like at the question and answer time. And then I'll just move to the next uh, attribute the shared realities, especially beyond human perspectives. And then, um, and then there are like a uh, family of works, but here I will just introduce one work, the, 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 the initial work, the archipelago, and then after uh, in superposition, in habitat, and so there are like a series of artworks which, is, uh, which are evolved from this archipelago. There's two video.
And then right now the sound, I will uh, lower the sound. Um, actually, there are five species are living on the, the these uh, three tons of uh, sand. And then um, the, when they also they eat, um, like they kind of have a very complex food chains to each other. And then when they eat, then they make a sound too. But I'll make it uh, lower so that I can uh, you can hear me. So in archipelago, uh, we projected the ecosystem from above. Onto, onto the sand, like these dunes. Um, a ceiling mounted depth camera detects the landscape's topo to, uh, topography, the shape, um, the shape in volume in real time, shaping the adaptive conditions of the species inhabiting it. So here, interactions are both destructive and constructive. Your shadow destroys the vegetation underneath at the base of the foot web. You became a force of death and life, like a wildlife or dancing shiva. The desolation is followed by greater fertility. So you kill them. And then once you kill um, the vegetation, and then like, you kind of sweep away the old other species. And after vegetation, they grow a lot further, a lot faster, and a lot abundantly. But if you feel you are a god to the virtual world, you are far from omnipotent. Intervention is nuanced in response, but uh, your influence is limited. So we don't control, we influence each other with all um, components. And then, so the work is evolved. To deepen the mixed reality, we redesigned the installation to use a clay sand that does not dry, thus allowing visitors to reshape the topography and even destroy and create new islands. Also, you can see the visitors may reach down to touch the land and they can see alien creatures creep onto their hands and then be able to lift these creatures up and carefully transport them to deposit it in other regions or islands or to their destruction. So um, we focus on the use of mixed reality as a method of shared playful and open-ended complexity in hybrid space between human and non-human beings. And then um, it was interesting for especially um, the exhibition at um, the, in Paris that at Capitaine Vaudois that um, the creator and, and us, we discussed and we, de decide, uh, we decided not to explain the, how this work is working. Instead, we just gave people a bestiary that um, just like they, they just visited to a foreign um, forest or the, the a zoo, like alien zoo. Mm -hmm. Sorry to interrupt, but it's been yes. 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for letting me know. Uh, so actually, um, I'm just moving to the last attribute. So the last attribute I want to introduce is the most recent work. And this work uh, was a new approach to combine artificial life and artificial intelligence and data art. And then um, and that our perspective and our focus was to let the future be a future. So uh, this is in front of NIU. Uh, and the NIC, the most recent artificial nature project. This project is very meaningful to us. Not only is it recently made, but also it takes a significant new direction in the way it combines real world open data resources, which we have been not, we haven't used. We have been generated data, but we didn't use the real world data, but uh, it was the first time to use that and then with evolutionary neural networks, that which um, is not, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of artificial intelligence uh, machine learning way. However, this is not the conventional way to use um, in artificial intelligence, nor the machine learning. Um, and then also the, the third one, uh, third, the, the, the feature is that to extend the more abstract space of its complex adaptive system to the scale of a city. So before our world was more like, it, it could be something in the like a very, very tiny world as a like a tiny universe or like can be um, in the macro, uh, uh, yeah, macro, the outer like universe, the scale. So scale was abstract, but um, this time like it was a scale of a city. At its heart, infranet is the speculative proposition of the data of a city as a habitat for new forms of life. 
So, um, and especially this um, the Inflana series, each exhibit um, utilizes public data available on the host city. Um, so it started from Gwangju. Um, that we were uh, commissioned in South Korea in 2018, and then it moved to New York in 2019. And then so we did the exhibition from August to, to December last year. And then also we had the exhibition in Vancouver. So whenever we have the, the exhibition in different cities, so we use the, the, the city data from different cities. Um, so here, also the first sound, that the sound, so we um, sample the sound and then the basic, uh, the fundamental ingredients of the sound is, uh, um, is a recording from the um sound. And then the, with that and the pulsations and uh, when they find the data and when they survive, then we kind of incorporate it into the sound. Um, so this is in front at Gwangju, the first uh, uh, prototype work uh, in the uh, in the infectionist of uh, intelligence. Um, so that was a kind of a new part, new part. And so that each color shows the taste uh, or the, the message of the, each agent. And when they get close to each other, they share that um, their intelligence or their messages, and then they infect each other. And I wanted to see the, how we make this kind of simulation of uh, the art, artwork as a simulation, and then that infectious of the, the, the message, how they, uh, when they can be homogeneous, like we wanted to see, but um, interestingly enough that it didn't become homogeneous, but instead it kind of changes the, the patterns and, and um, tastes again and again. Um, anyway, anyway, we are exploring neural evolution of augmenting um, topologies for agents and aim to combine this uh, with curiosity driven behavior. So here there's no like a specific goal to solve. So uh, and also we are not training our neural network uh, with uh, like existing the, the like a large quantity of data sets. Instead they are they are born and then they are learning data. And then um, we they have some fitness functions that they they are that we, because we have the data sets as we can compare they are learning well or not. So if they are learn, learning well then they can survive longer and if they don't learn well then they, they die or they die. Um, only, but what we have, otherwise they have more freedom to just uh, to live. So their kind of goal, only goal is like to just live there. Um, so I, I think I will explain more in time. So I just move to the next. Um, so it's, this is in front of um, New York. So we can see like according to the, the different data sets from different city that um, the shapes are a little bit different, but overall um, like kind of the structures look pretty the same. Um, today, the overwhelming quantities of data invisibly overflow the world and the city. The city, uh, so city data can be an abstraction of the city to reveal certain patterns, but it's also an alien double of it. So the, for me, the interesting thing is that the artificial life is like it's a, as a possible life forms that it imitates something, some patterns from existing life, life as we know, and then it shows uh, it's an alien double. Um, and then the city data, city data uh, distinguishes cities, but they are not city. It's just the abstraction double of the city. So for us, it kind of made it like okay, we had the, like a strange. Uh, it was the style was very different as, as like our previous works, but it gave kind of a, um, like a good um, the satisfaction in terms of this like the the double abstraction, double alien double of the city, and, and as an as a habitat, there are this. Um, alien double of us as a this uh, um, artificial life species are like inhabiting it and and kind of it kind of gave us like this um, double abstraction of completion <laughs> so it was interesting to us. Um, uh, but, Dr. Uh, Haruji, yes? sorry, yes. but it's almost fifteen minutes. Uh, 
I think it's, it's, uh, the, my presentation file says that it's like 18 minutes, <laughs> but I think I have a, I think I have a 45 minutes, right? You have and then, 10 more minutes. You have a 10 more minutes. It's a professor supposed to have a 25 minutes. <laughs> I think I saw that from the, the I heard uh, uh, from the, um, what was it? The, I saw that my time slot is 45 minutes and then I, uh, I was asked to make my, uh, my presentation in 25 minutes. So yeah, I think it's, uh, this is our last, um, um, almost last, like, uh, there'll be one more closing work. But yeah, so I think the time is okay. So, um, but our interest is not to answer predetermined um human centric questions so that so that's more like conventional ai machine learning that they should have like predetermined questions to answer and then the, the problem should be clear there so that answers can be clear but um how but what we are interested in was a more intrinsic texture and qualities of the data in its own right um, that's to offer a word by considering the data itself as a habitat for possible life. These life forms embody some of the mechanisms of, um, of life as we know it, as I already explained. They are born and they die, and they have metabolism and intelligence, the perception and social and collective behaviors. They share their, uh, what they like with like, their neighbors, even though they look very simple, like dots. Uh, but they are also uh, virtual and another abstraction of the word as A and W. So um, I just, I repeat it. And then, um, so it became, um, it's, this is the Vancouver version. So if you uh, know the Vancouver area, then this is the Stanley Park area. And um, I hope that I, the sound is very, very low. So I, I'll just um, talk. Um, in ecosystemic art, um, generally, it is well recognized uh, nice that the depth of uh, living behavior is deeply dependent on the qualities of the environment it inhabits. A uh, vibrant and diverse ecosystem needs an environment that is rich with niches in interestingly non-uniform distributions to support it. A good space in which to find many different local ways of making a living, a sufficiently complex landscape of capacity for um, variety to be discovered. We believe geospatial city data is rich in this way, so that's why we chose the city. And also, it's uh, kind of our uh, friendly and a good scale in the environment. And then because as uh, bringing this uh, um, artificial life ecosystem as an artwork, it was very interest. Uh, it, uh, it was uh, a challenge that to communicate with the human participants. Uh, we adopted the neural networks with the dynamic topology within an evolutionary simulation that is unsupervised and without objective and highly liquid through social exchange. So um, that I think I kind of repeated again in the way. And then um, just wanted to share some of the, the data behind this. So um, this is a site specific work. We use a vari uh, uh, um, variety of uh, geospatial data of the designated city, focusing on regions and particular pathways of flow, like water, electricity, transit, or um, public resident, uh, public area area or residential area, forest, uh, extra. And for each exhibit, we gather data from open government sources, usually, or open street map, or or depths, uh, or digital elevation map data, like DM map and extra. And then here, uh, so typically machine learning, um, this neural network topology is uh, um, designed to match a specific problem and only weights. Um, I think it's kind of more technical part. So I think I will just a little bit skip this. So um, just uh, that here, uh, I think the more important part is that uh, why it's not conventional the method is that the conventional method, the neural network is a lot more complicated than this. And then they need a lot of data set to train the neural network to uh, function that the neural network, so that that neural network function to predict the patterns of like data sets. But instead of what, what we use is a small numbers of um, this neural network. And in time, if they survive well, then uh, we can apply the evolutionary algorithm into the, neuro, the structure of the neural network. Um, so that's the difference. But this is good for more like open-ended problems that where the problem is not 
clear. And so that we don't need to bound from the past. And, and this is the last. So I have like, I think that two or three more, like about a few more minutes. So, and this is current. Um, um, so here, it's just more like a general uh, statement. Art is a human activity, always seeking inspirations and relations from and within nature. And um, our work, artificial nature, like how you can see the, um, the distinguished characteristics of our work. The greatest interest in the uh, boundary helped me to create what is possible. The boundary is the mixture of order, disorder, um, and more diversities, more dynamic agents. For me, the boundary is very essential to the vibrance of the world as an open living system. The possible is not only the imaginable, but is an expansion of the rear to the unknown. Um, so here, the and then uh, there was the, the, the boundary, boundary part. And Andrew's Kronto is an alien world as it could be inviting visitors to participate within an ecosystem of relations. So you can see here um, that the components and also again, the infinite, the feedback loop. So how they influence to each other. Um, our invitation is to the creative exploration of a possible world, which is an expanded boundary of the rear. So, Here is Andrew's current. I'm bringing this possible alien world so that we can alienate uh, um, the uh, alienate, alienate, alienate our world first, and then seek what the possible and the and the rear is in our own. What we're making is creating our cultural environment, which we are continuously adapting to. Therefore, it is to shape us to what we want to become. So I think that's it. So thank you. So this is our, um, you can find our uh, website um, to see more. And then uh, here is the third, our third member, Ina. Uh, thank you. So I think it's, uh, um, I'm done. So I think I will stop sharing that the screen. Question at answer yeah. time. Okay. Oh, hi. Hello, wow. so now I can see you. Yeah, <laughs> now you can see us, right? I was uh, waving hands or giving signal, hand yeah. signal. You can see any of that, right? Actually, so, when I... Sean, so Sean Ra has a question. She has the oh, okay. hand emoji. Up. Yeah. Before we take uh, the question, um, I just want to quickly compensate what I forgot to mention um, about the last um, key points that in the slide existed. I think no one, the, and I missed uh, because um, how the third forum that as you saw the um, presentation of how professor haruji we aim to expand your horizon what asia related research is about so uh, we had a quite i noticed the limited idea about what asia re related research and professor haruji when she was first invited she said do you think it is going to be suitable for your forum the reveal itself is limited, um, fixed idea of what Asia uh, related research or research that related to Asia and Asia Global. So um, today's forum, uh, um, thanks to the diversity of topics that, um, that many researchers engaged, um, um, they are from Asia and Asia Global domains. And I hope that helps to expand your horizon of the research we do here. Thanks a lot. Yeah, question. Who was the, the, um, yep. So Shen Ro Chao had a question. Thank you, Shen Ro Chao. You have um, voices, should we help you to, Shen, yeah, uh, we, I should ask to unmute. Yes, I did unmute, ask to, okay. Shen Yu Chao, are you unmuted? Hi, Shen Ro. Hi, hello. Hi. Yeah. Wave your hands, where are you? but I was just clapping my hand. Ah, okay, you are shy to uh, um, uh, share the video of you? Uh, it's fine. It's okay, uh, either way. We have three ways, a video, uh, video, voice only, and chat box only. 
Yeah. Yep. Please okay. go ahead. Yes. It's your turn. Yes, Cheryl. Please go ahead. Oh, actually, I'll just clap my hands. Oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So was it okay to deliver? I mean, I couldn't see any anyone, so I couldn't see the responses. Yes. Yeah, was it like more like talking to myself? So I really be worried about how. Uh, yeah, I I, I love the lecture and I wanted more actually. But anyway, Sharon, please go ahead if you have a question. So first, uh, you enjoy the lecture and um and your question. Do you have any? Oh, I haven't got like the question yet. Yeah. Oh, I see. So you were just clapping. <laughs> okay. So this is like little um, uh, miscommunications um, uh, that we do as a first online forum. Um, just uh, taking this opportunity, Sharon Kao, could you introduce uh, your name and where uh, where is your location, please? Quickly. Oh, yes, sure. so my name is Sharon Kao, and I am right now I'm in Toronto, and I was um, originally I'm from China. And Hello is actually my primary advisor for my thesis topic. Ah, I see. Yeah, because I'm very interested in artificial nature. Oh, I yeah. see. Are you a digital future student? Uh, not really. I'm an IMD student. And okay. I'm a colleague of Ma Ma Mari. Okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. Any other question, please? Yes. We. I'm sure we have a lot of questions. We. In the MOOC forum, we had too many questions and we ended up having too many discussions <laughs> before this forum. So please don't be shy, even though you want to ask the same question, please. Aaron, don't be shy. <laughs> please. Um, so Jing Yang, Jing Yang Kim has a question and then Leon. Yeah. And then Aaron. Hi. Hello. Hi, Jing Yang. Hi. <laughs> Thank you for the lecture. It was uh, really interesting to learn about your work. Um, I just have a question about this species that you that lives in this uh, artificial nature. Yes, um, I, yeah. So I, I, the way I understand it, that it is a it is a species that has an intelligence and uh, has a social capacity, mm -hmm. and then it is being unleashed in these different places. Mm -hmm. to create their own ecosystem yes. or like to uh, grow in their own system. Mm -hmm. I was sort of, um, because I feel like maybe there has been a lot of investments into engineering what this species yeah, right. actually, the behaviors and how it would, you know, there's maybe a lot of simulations in terms of how it would construct itself uh, a place or uh, its identities and stuff like that. Um, I'm just wondering, what is their sense of time or have you got to that point to figure that out because like uh, the movement yeah. as it is being projected on these surfaces they are quite fast in their movements and they are sort of like moving um and like i i understand the dots are individuals right like they're supposed to be an individual species um spreading mm -hmm. and trying to work through the system and uh, I noticed that they're very fast in their movement. So yeah, I don't know if you have an answer to it or if you are in the middle of researching that, but. Uh, yeah, actually it's a really interesting question because that I was talk uh, thinking about time a lot and especially for us that the, in um, the physical world and then the, when we say that real world like versus the virtual world that we have a specific space and time and then we share our calendar together and then we share the clock, this is the clock, so we know exactly like when it's one like but um and then when we created the virtual world that the time was like something was difficult to control um and especially that um in terms of uh, like making the evolutionary artificial life uh, uh, world making that actually you can so it's a virtual world so you can make them live faster like kind of beyond that our recognition like our perceptional capacity so that they can, uh, so that uh, without the bottleneck, they can they can kind of uh, make the like a faster evolutions. How, uh, however, this is an artwork. So that the communication with the participants are really important. So that it should be something like uh, need to be recognizable, and then actually the need to be like this rec like this recognizable um, thing became um, not only it also gives. Um, 
the this artificial life forms when when you design them it gives kind of more concrete features into it too so still the time is a little bit abstract that um it's not like it's different as our time and um and that's okay that also it's um it's my future work that i want to give them a time which can compare like it's more like comparative to our physical world because when i create um this virtual ecosystem i think the relations between the the physical world and the virtual world and actually to to show that what's possible but that what's possible is always related to what's what's real so so this is like something like i want to keep kind of working on it but there's no like a definite answer but um this infranet the work the time is a little bit different uh, for the species compared to the previous works because previous works when the species are born then they have um that that they need to continuously eat that certain and they get aged so they have the age component within them but for infranet they don't have age so if they can learn well and they are healthy, then like some species are live like kind of um, infinitely, and they just get smarter and smarter. But um, it's not like a, they, uh, for them, they are, the intelligence is not complicated. It's a, a little bit uh, like a simpler kind of version, like how viruses are surviving or bacteria are surviving. So okay. yeah, so. <clears throat> All right. But yeah. yeah. It's okay. Uh, it's super interesting. So um, the uh, I have I, maybe I'll make one more question and then pass on to the next Other person. person. Yes. Um, <laughs> I think the so the city to city species are different intelligence from the ones that we've shown before. Like, do they have a continuation between the two, or um, um, are they connected at all? The way they um, so, but, and also, uh, this is another question, the city to city species, are they feeding off of the city system to be, to learn from their, the city system to survive or do they have their own system? So how they survive is that um, the, the species at the beginning, they are like empty, um, empty, um, the emptiness, they were born. And then they have this little neural network to learn about the data. So they actually, each one knows like uh, kind of there are the layer of data sets, but the, mm -hmm. um, as the, at, when they were born, they know only like a few layers of the data. And then they started to, to try to find to the, the data sets, like how kind of data is um, is there, and then but it's like they have some uh, flexibility to make uh, mistakes always. So some things are floating and never can learn, and then and then floating. And then what we are doing is that while like a system is learning, we compare each agent that if they learn well, and if they don't learn well, then they die. So they just floating and disappears, floating and disappears. And then if they learn well, then we give them like, a, the, we evaluate them. Like, and so actually there are two screens and I didn't explain much, but so one screen, there's a big simulation. The other, ah, this is actually the, my virtual background. So it shows that it, this is the immune system. Immune system is watching. So it's like observing um, that um, observers. <laughs> so it's like cybernetic and we try to apply the cybernetic notion and um, this is kind of biological CCTV. So it's kind of tracking the each agent and then like how they kind of communicate with the, the, the next, uh, the, your, the neighbors. So down there, there's a little uh, letters are showing the in real time that uh, first it's learning well, it's like how much you're healthy. And then the second one is the, your taste. So your taste um, by uh, compared to like, your divergence, how much your, your taste is different compared to the average of your neighborhood. So we are showing that. So we wanted to track down two things, like um, kind of wanted to see the, how they learn well. And then um, the second thing is the how like when they share the, the, the taste is a color. So they, uh, for example, that you are born at the forest, then you like the forest and then you show the green. 
color. And then you meet the person who, uh, the, 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 the another creature who was born in the, 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 the road data. And then they have seen only roads, so they like roads. And then like, they kind of speak each other. And then they are like, who runs well? Like, they influence more. And tastes are mixed together. So in time, like they are like a the mixing taste taste together, and I wanted to see in that way because uh, actually when we make it, when we design this um, work, we were influenced by the the news that the fake news spread, spread so fast, but the uh, complex ideas spread very slowly, and then um, kind of really curious about that phenomenon and kind of wanted to bring that as a simulation to the work. Um, so that I'm not sure, like maybe I think I kind of a little bit drifted from your question, right? <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, and I have a question. Leon had. Mm -hmm. You can, Leon, you go first and then me. <laughs> Leon, you go first. Thank you. Um, thank you, Professor Haruji, for your lecture and for sharing your work with us. Um, I thought the Infinite Project was very interesting. And I also thought of think of the doubling that you were talking about, where the system that you created act as a double to reality, but not exactly reality. And I was wondering how does the site specific component of the work um, ch challenges or changes the work? Or I guess I'm asking whether or not when you adapt this sort of organism to different typographies in different cities, do the learning outcome, does the learning outcome changes? Um, the first of all, they learn the, because the, the open data are from like a rose or the forest or the residential areas. So that, that is, we have uh, exposed the maps of the cities. So everybody kind of recognize their cities or like uh, that the famous cities. So that when they adopt and, and the, at the beginning, it was not the city, but soon that um, the city shapes kind of um, like uh, um, emergent from the, the system and then people recognize it. And, um, at the moment too, that um, from the work to work, we always try to make like a, some the evolvement. Um, so it's a little bit um, different as before, but at the moment, like it's not really like distinguishable to us, to makers. However, for uh, participants, people respond very, very differently. So for example, in New York, the, because we use the open data from the government or the, from the um, just public resources that uh, where it's like, and then, but then the species are um, like thriving, and then, they, then when they are thriving, they are healthy. Then they are they are they are more shiny. So that where there is more light, and then we had a criticism of the, from the participants that why why you just uh, make them your agents leave florist into so much like this commercial um, like. The commercialized, like a highly commercialized, uh, the concentrated area, so so called as like a rich area. Why your virtual creatures are living like so nice, like so thriving in the the rich area, and then like rather like the poor neighbors, they are it's dimmed. And then that why you don't uh, um, address that this like this equality, <laughs> the, the financial the disequality. And for us, that we did just uh, it was because probably that a highly concentrated uh, um, capital areas um, have more data, more open data, so the, 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 there there can be more species. Um, so those. Um, because the New York is an expensive city, so that we so in that way we had a different. Uh, um, the, the feedback from participants. So the system, the agents, how they can, how they live and then survive and make the patterns are similar. But because the city has its own characteristics, they re, they they reflect the, those characteristics. So. <laughs> All right, cool. And um, thank you for your answer. Um, that's very interesting to know that there's. It also has to do with the way that data has been collected. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's really cool. Thank you. So, I mean, we, we also have a lot about the city. Like when, whenever we make the, the, um, this work, then we learn more about the city. Yeah. But um, we try to not to um, reflect our perspective perspective too much. I mean, everybody's political. Like even like I said, I'm not political. That, that, means, my, that, that means it's my political statement. But um, still, we wanted to take it out from like a certain um, like perspective. And then like a, instead, like we want to invite like a lot of perspectives.
into the system as, as a diverse habitat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just maybe some, uh, uh, I mean, maybe just a very tiny questions um, regarding the, you know, the, the scope of uh, interdisciplinarity um, in the artificial life um, creator. Um, seemingly, it's a super interdisciplinary, which is just seemingly intimidatingly um, um, a new type of research seemingly need to be embarked uh, in this uh, type of um, form of art. And I wonder what, if you could help uh, me, people like me, uh, what kind of, uh, let's say, humanity research, um, research on computer languages, or so social science research, you already mentioned that you need to also interact with, you know, um, government, um, like local officials to get data and et cetera. Um, can you name those disciplines that you need to cover? Um, because it's not just the display of technology neither, right? There is a lot of humanistic, qualitative, yes. somewhat mm -hmm. messages, that, which is my next question. But I will just stop here so for you to be able to yeah, share your answer, please. Thank you. I think the, the interdisciplinarity and then transdisciplinarity, I think that's uh, kind of one of the characteristics of our time, because in our time, like so many developments, and then so uh, developments which lead our expansion of our perception are um, based on the dis trans transdisciplinary or interdisciplinary approaches. And then um, the, but however, like each work has uh, its specific kind of attributes between like different uh, disciplines. It's not all, not like every interdisciplinary work are the same kind of, you know, uh, in, in terms of intensities or in terms of how many disciplines are kind of mingled together. But for me, like to make this kind of work, the, um, actually I kind of pick up three attributes, uh, or th three attributes and then three probably like a, um, um, or to just send to three um, areas together. So the first um, three attributes is the first one is the uh, computation. So the computation, um, I, um, I see it as a, the, the art object. And then the second one is the natural systems. So the computation is like it includes um, probably I think when I see computation, maybe this computational language, but more like a, um, for me is the, the algorithms, mm -hmm. is the uh, generative art, because so computation is generative art. Um, so generative, uh, generative, generative is the anything that um, using the set of rules to to make the, the result um, and then so it can be highly um, the, the real time and then if it's real time then also it can be interactive and then I think that what's interesting is for me nature is computational mm -hmm. so and then us human is also computational so that's one thing and the second one is that also uh, we need to study about natural systems so natural systems of um, like, for example, like a void systems, like how the fish are flocking or the birds are flocking or um, how the, the this endless forms like the, the, from like different species, they, we share, like fish are all sharing the similar characteristics, but with, uh, between species, there are distinguishable um, the differences at those things. And then actually um, so far, like there's so many biologists and then um, mathematicians, they found them or like um, that, that, what was it? The, um, the graphical topologies or like so many, especially mathematicians, they have found so many the, uh, defined as a mathematical function to describe the natural systems. So this organic systems. So that uh, what I can kick up as a second attribute is the natural systems. And then the third one is as an artist, that um, the immersive finesse, I kind of named it as immersive finesse. So that was from like artist, like art practices from the artist studio background. And then with like art histories, like understanding about art histories, so fine art areas, and we're focusing on what's happening as an art experience. So how like uh, artists and artwork, and then also participants can share the experience. Can it, it could be gallery system or the beyond gallery. I want to write yeah. down the, the immersive and the last yes. one, finesse. Uh, finesse, yes. 
mm -hmm. so more like completion. Um, and then the, uh, the other parts um, that how um, how I kind of made this artificial nature project, there are three kind of categories. Like one is world making. So as a, as a world making that I kind of did the practice. And the other one is that I, um, I have an MFA in sculpture. And then like, and at the, I went to um, art high school, art middle school. <laughs> so I have a very um, the long history of um, the, the, the training as um, the art, like a traditional artist. And then, so that is certainly like the other direction. And then because it made me to have some specific uh, sensibilities so I think the the, um, the expressive uh, and the sensibilities are really important. And then the other one, the last part uh, is from the science. Actually, I didn't. I'm uh, um, computer graphics. Understanding about computer languages are important, but I think the understanding about science is was more important. And especially not about. I mean, as an artist, there's always a limitation to understand the science, but to share the question together. I think that was very interesting. So the, the my initial question is, what is life? And then, what is life? And then, and then I followed um, when artificial life, um, the field has a, um, the kind of established in nine, there was in, around like 1984 to 87, and then how it kind of their artificial life art evolved from from the influence of artificial life art field. But um, the first question, what is life? I think it was really interesting because the what is life was something not so difficult to answer for many, many years to us. But um, only recently, it became a lot more difficult to answer. What is really life? So those, uh, those, uh, those interests kind of made me that, oh yeah, yes, definitely. Like I, I need to share those questions together. And then, um, and also our time permits and allows like many insights and then also mechanisms that we can be, um, that we can work on the like interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary um, subjects. Thank you very much. And I um, have an urge to clarify, life is very hard to understand, I found, but um, you guys have come up with something else and I kind of want to interrogate more, but l let me give uh, maybe the chance to um, others to ask questions. We have already 31 people here behind the screen. <laughs> uh, anyone else has a question? I have a question, but I'm going to suppress myself, please. I have a question. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I also Introduce want to your guy, that. yourself. Please. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm Jessica. Um, Hello, Jessica. Hello. <laughs> um, yeah. Thank you so much for that very, yeah, a very like, different perspective to me in in the Asian uh, Asian global st studies also in the art field um, and I like what you just said like what is life and I think that is a question that all artists deal with so I am I definitely um, relate to that but I was wondering in general like how you feel um, is your position in relation to other artists in other disciplines? Like, do you connect with them? Are you able to like converse with them? Or do you feel like maybe like, because I see, I don't know, I'm not very familiar with like um, your subject, but I think it's, it's definitely related. But I was wondering like, how do you feel in your position in the art world compared to like other artists? Yeah. Very good question. I had a similar question. Do you interact with uh, <laughs> AI technicians uh, yeah. more than maybe other artists in the art world or, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. you know, computer programming? Uh, I think it's, uh, maybe it doesn't need to be complex, but I think it's somewhat complex. <laughs> There's uh, some somewhat complicated point. And um, uh, because that when I showed the, my first artificial nature, um, I, it was in Shanghai. And then I participated uh, with my first artificial nature work there, and I met my previous um, colleagues there. And then what's interesting because the, 
when I showed the work, like the, especially kids, the children were the best participants of our work. <laughs> and, the, the, and then they just jumped in, they, they played and then they kind of enjoyed it like hours. And a while my previous uh, colleagues kind of asked me like, why your art is, okay, why art is, your art is so complicated? Why is it so complex? Why? Like, so it was more like a criticism or there was mm -hmm. a second criticism that um, actually that kind of helped us to evolve to the next level. But before Time of Doubles, that um, there was a, the creator um, gave me a really interesting the criticism that your work is too beautiful. It's like, a, it's too beautiful. And then it was a, certainly it was criticism. So because that, I found out that because the, the, the endless forms and the lives are beautiful. So we make it flourishing. There is no, nothing to threaten them. And then there was uh, something wrong. <laughs> and then so, uh, was it, was so it was not okay because um, the, actually the many artificial life artists, there were kind of few of them had like art practitioner background. Mm -hmm. So they were not intro, uh, invited to the gallery system much. The gallery system doesn't really include artificial life art, but however, conferences, um, usually like the conferences, they, they invite more, although they are like now art and technology centers, they have um, more exhibitions about those. So there are kind of the newer, the newer venues are invited as new artists, but, um, and then the lesser um, artists background, um, artists are working on this, this area. And then because, but um, I, f I did, like, I went to Artemis art school, art high school and in MFA. So um, especially like I, everything like, I did in South Korea. So, so in terms of my identity, I'm like, I think I'm, I'm like, uh, uh, it's a kind of right to be uh, the working as like, I'm, I'm, how can I say? Um, I grew up in, I was born in um, South Korea and then um, on the, just before I started my PhD, I, I, I finished all my schools in, it, in, in Seoul. Um, so because of that, I had connections in Seoul. So in Seoul, the, to be invited to galleries, like for me, it was easier because I have connections. <laughs> But um, outside of uh, Seoul, um, the other parts was more like a newer, newer galleries. Digital galleries are invited, but um, so far, actually, in Toronto, I'm having little troubles because I don't. I'm starting to <laughs> to be connected, but uh, not yet. My connection is weak, and then also um, the here um, this like, artificial life art what hasn't been as like uh, the, the established area in the um, the visual art system. So mm -hmm. compared to the, my kind of previous years that the, um, the exhibition, um, like a kind of the invitations are all are lower. So, but still um, that I need more time to develop. So yeah, it's just, it's, that's kind of the, 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 this is kind of the honest status at the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm looking forward to see more of more of your work here and like I think in general more of this kind of work. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Kathy, we are having an uh, amazing discussion, but it's the time is like we have spent already one hour, right? Am I correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. Yeah, so I think we should move on to the next one. And so thanks a lot, Professor Haruji. That was very uh, inspiring opening of our uh, series of talk today. Thanks a lot. Thank, thank you. you for, uh, thank you for the discussion. Yeah, club icon. I don't know how to use a club icon yet. Club. <laughs> yep, I'm learning. Thank you. And some, yeah, this is it. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, uh, next uh, speaker, again, would you like, Kelsey, would you like to announce who's the next speaker? Who is nervously waiting here? Okay, I'm nervous. So, <laughs> <laughs> so the next speaker is Marisa Gawara. Sorry if I mispronounced your last name. Uh, she's an interdisciplinary master's in art, media, and design at OCAD. Um, so her current essay is on uh, what can cyborgs do about race? Japanesism, false memories, and honor, honorary whites. Great, thank you for that introduction. So my name is Mari. Um, I am an interdisciplinary artist and I work mostly with digital imagery and uh, image and, image and text works. And my research interests are 
on orientation of Asian individuals within the dialectical tension between global Asia and the West, with a specific focus on different kinds of Orientalism. So these are some of my past works. Um, so, to, oh, um, so today, I'll first, um, sorry, I'll show my work in progress, which is a short film that I propose to expose Oriental fantasies that exist in the West and Japan while using Donna Haraway's idea of cyborgs as a methodology to move away from essentialist debates around Japanese identity or the idea of Japan. And I'll first attempt to provide a basic idea of Asian identity among the Japanese people and aim to politicize the fact that many actually don't identify as Asians and some exhibit traits of being honorary whites. And then I'll look at the history of Japanese identity through the economic campaign called Cool Japan and then discuss how Japanese nets became marketable and how Japan internalizes and actively invites an orientalist gaze. And then we'll look at how what cyborg, um, Haraway's concept of cyborg, can do about Japanese identity or race. Okay. So as a Japanese person who also grew up in England, I noticed that many Japanese refer to Asians as exotics, just like how the West perceives Asia. And in a lot of people's mind, I noticed that Asia is an imagined is imagined as an impoverished continent, which Japan is somehow not a subset of. But of course the term Asian is just a classification and it's a colonial term. So it's a ranking that was created by the Occident, which is not embedded in nature, but is man-made. But I feel always curious, so like why do Japanese people not see themselves as members of the Asian community? And what are the reasons behind that? Um, here is a survey result of a brief study conducted by a master's student at Keio University in Japan in 2005 and 2009. And she attempted to shed light on Asian ident identity among the Japanese. And the survey was conducted over two periods. Um, the questionnaire survey conducted in 2005 um, analyzed um, around 100 responses and in 2009, 130 responses were collected and interpreted through statistical methods. And the, in the survey, respondents were asked to complete questionnaires to indicate the degree of identification as Japanese and Asians on a scale to express their ideas of the relationship between Japan and Asia in pictorial form and to list number of words that they associate with Asia. And the result here suggests that Japanese people have awareness of Japan's existence as a part of a greater region, but the number of people who believe Japan and Asia as related entities are decreasing, and only around one-fifth of participants believe that Japan and Asia is a separate entities. And they were asked to list freely any number of words they associate with Asia. So the responses were grouped into the 17 categories listed. And you can see that the images relating to food and economics tops the list. But it's very noticeable that many of these examples are very negative. So for example, like anti-Japanese demonstrations, um, terrorism, yellow skin, small eyes, exotics, um, dark smelly weeks. So they're very um, you see that there is an internalized racism and a colonized Euro-American kind of sensibility there. So why do Japanese people commonly did not see themselves as members of the Asian community? And actually there's a very long history behind this. So in Japan, Asia has been viewed in the same way that the West did as an inferior other, which viewed took place in a form of the Datsua Nio slogan, which took precedence in Japan toward the end of the 19th century. So literally meaning break away from Asia and enter Europe, this slogan represented Japan's will to become a separate entity from the rest of Asia and to justify its role as the leader of the region by constructing the discursive regions, Asia, Japan, and the West. And the concept of the greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere um, this imperialist concept mooted in 1940, 
And while appearing to call for Asian co countries to stand in solidarity as allies against the Western colonial oppression, this focused once again on Japan's role as a leader in Asia. And it was frequently used by militarists and nationalists who saw this pan-Asian ideals as an effective policy vehicle, vehicle through which to strengthen Japan's position and advance its dominance within Asia. And another reason for the sense of superiority towards the imagined Asian countries comes from the myth of Japan as a homogenous country and the fact that they celebrate its uniqueness, which separates itself from other non-homogenous Asian countries, which contributes to the idea of Japan as a standalone country within Asia. And Japan's post-war nationalist project placed an emphasis on assimilating and domesticating non-Japanese elements and defined the Japanese culture in clearly essentialist terms, such that Japanese culture eventually became a culture that is put up for display for the purpose of distinguishing and defining Japan's national identity as Tain's means of kokka, meaning homogenous, which excludes the existence of victims of systematic racism that includes um, indigenous people of Ainu, Okinawans, and Zainichi Koreans, Zainichi Chinese, and Bulakuni, and the list goes on. So Japanese government promotes the idea that Japan is homogenous and celebrates its ethnic purity, yet mixed individuals or so-called Hafu people are in many ways celebrated in mass media and it's embedded in social norms as well. And I believe that this contradiction is a sign of Japan being caught in the complicit opposition of being between one of the first to modernize or to westernize in Asia, and but also being secondary to the West, and therefore exhibiting traits of as honorary whiteness or pseudo whiteness, while because of its history also internalizing having a colonized or Euro American sensibilities and uh, the view of the world. So now I'd like to talk about how Japan, and um, which now presents itself as a country with a clean past, became quote unquote cool, and what constitutes Japanese national identity and Japanese-ness. So the idea of um, cool Japan or, is very closely linked to the construction of Japanese identity and the topics I just mentioned, such as um, the myth of homogeneity or So the cool Japan policy um, it strategically conveys the attractiveness of Japan. And it's significant, this policy is very significant for understanding not just the contemporary economic and um, political climate in Japan, but also for thinking of what constitutes Japanese-ness or the national identity of Japan, which Japan promotes itself to be. And there are many programmatical aspects of using Japanese tradition as a means to add uncontested respectability to Japan or appropriating market-made images of Japan for national ends. Um, cool Japan is the exploration of the Japan brand strategy, which has been adopted by the government of Japan, as well as trade bodies seeking to exploit the commercial capital of the country's culture industry following the World War II. And interestingly, up until the 90s, the dominant Japanese exporting strategy of selling consumer goods, as well as media content, actually focused on consciously erasing any remnant of Japanese culture or door. So Japanese-ness was not considered cool back then. And the globalization of Japanese popular culture happened during a time of lingering recession in Japan. So the 90s saw upsurges of anti-Japanese sentiment around Asia, um, echoing the unresolved legacies of a shared past joined by several relations during the Cold War. And that now needed to be repaired within the context of newly forming regional economic and political cultural ties. So war memory and post-war responsibility or what is seen around Asia as the inadequate official Japanese expression of remorse over its uh, militaristic aggressive past became topics of broad regional debates. And these debates were recurrently inflamed throughout the decade by dramatic controversies. And that include um, grassroots campaign for official Japanese apology to and compensation of comfort women or um, sex slaves who were forced to serve Japanese troops during the Pacific War. 
and the massive demonstrations around Asia in reaction to the commemoration of the world dead at Yasukuni Shrine by government officials. And there were demonstrations around Asia in reaction to revisionist Japanese high school history textbooks that whitewashed Japanese aggressiveness in Asia during World War II. So trying to find new directions that would lead out of a lingering recession and would position Japan as an um, economic leader in the East Asian region, and the former Prime Minister Junichiro, Koizumi Junichiro, declared in his policy speech that the government of Japan would develop a national policy of intellectual property in the form of innovative and creative products such as content products. And this policy produces a revitalizing cultural imagery for Japan by capitalizing on the global success of Japanese popular culture through a very detailed reconstructions of the selective appropriation of products in order to create a new positive cultural imagery for Japan. And this policy also promotes a specific sense of cultural identity. And it's notable that although Japan brand was conceptualized to offer a new revitalized imagery for Japan abroad, it still resorts to a familiar and conservative self exoticizing discourse that's been popular in the post-war Japanese intellectual discourses on national and cultural identity. So the Japan brand strategy of Cool Japan is thus seen as a means to revitalize patriotic pride and recruit those patriotic feelings for national ends. Um, I think I'm going to skip this part because I don't have too much time. So unlike the image of Japan as it emerges from contemporary popular culture products, the imagery promoted by the Japan brand is not of cutting edge, but of a country with a clean record in which the country um, it promotes the idea that Japan is a country that just seamlessly emerged from a past with no shadows. And it's more dramatically even, it ignores in a forgetful fashion that for millions in Asia, Japan's cultural tradition is associated with Japan's history of imperial aggressiveness in the Asian region. And this policy is an effort at political capitalization, coercively manipulated out of an otherwise disinterested consumer trend. And by binding the past and the present, policymakers in Japan seem to believe that the success of Japanese popular culture in Asia can be used to induce collective amnesia in regard to Japan's colonial past and launch Japan into a new political future. So um, I argue, so in my film, I explore the idea that the idea of Japan or Japanese-ness is like propaganda and like hardware is manufactured, mass produced, and then advertised just like the empty idea of the cool Japan policy. So in my short film, I use the concept of cyborgs by Donna Haraway, who is a feminist scholar. And this concept fundamentally subverts ideas of authenticity. So Haraway defines the cyborg in four different ways in her essay, um, The Cyborg Manifesto. And the first one is as the cyborg is a cybernetic organism. And the second is a hybrid of machine and organism. The third as a creature of lived social reality. And the fourth is a creature of fiction. So Haraway cyborg, um, cyborg is a useful tool in order to move beyond essentialist debates surrounding um, Asian identity or any identity in the West and to the link from problematic Western traditions such as patriarchy, colonialism and essentialism um, which allow for the problematic formations of taxonomies and identifications of the other uh, what Haraway explains as antagonistic dualism that order Western discourse. So in the film I'm using this um, her concept of cyborg as the methodology to move away from essentialist and existing binaries. And I argue that um, the idea of Japan or Japanese-ness, which Japan presents to the rest of the world, is created by the internalized Western gaze and Japan's historic revisionism, which leads to whitewashed amalgamation of information that is then accumulated to assimilate false, sent, um, false cultural memories, much like how viruses can infiltrate database. 
And that data, which is now bugged, is then used to construct contemporary Japanese cultural identity, and which is based on false collective memory and the fictional, um, the myth of homogeneity and Japanese-ness, which is mass produced. Um, I will show sorry, the first four or five minutes of the film. And before I play, I'll just briefly explain the plot. So the film is from a perspective of a cyborg who is leaving Tokyo to Toronto. And with its cybernetic mindset, the cyborg is very confused with a flooded sources of information on the internet about cultural context and Orientalism, which is facilitated by lack of information. And the only solution the cyborg can come to is to get more data to have an understanding of the world. And she merges with Alexa in the end, which is supposed to expand her knowledge and liberates her, but she's still confined within the data. I'm just going to play it. Let me know if the sound is not. Oh, yeah, no sound, is it? Okay. How come? I hear the word Japan. The sound is okay. I do not see the faces of my family members. I do not see my house. I do not see the elementary school I attended. I do not see the Buddhist temple. I do not see the izakayas with red noran. No sushi. No Mount Fuji. No hard-working salarymen. No geishas. No ninjas. No koto players. What do you see then? A shopping mall and hero, a fruit shop and a small bookstore, trash cans, four telephone poles line the slope in front of a house, electric wires zigzagging and blocking the sky, taxis and drivers with white lace gloves, women in knee-length pencil skirts and high heels, the logo of the million, the Chinese restaurant chain, Yes, these are the things that are. The other things are not. Nostalgia. Deleted. Emotions. Deleted. Images. Saved. Trash cans. Saved. Electric wires are part of the sky. Saved. The intersection of a motor sando. Saved. Expressionless people walking. Saved. Select all remaining data. Move to memory. Listen to the music and write down whatever comes to you. The man in front of the class plays Yellow Magic on Spotify. This is a creative writing class, so I start writing. I hate this song. I hate this song. I late this song. I hate this song. I make this song. I date this song. I hate this song. I rate this song. I hate this song. I hate this song. I say this song. I fate this song. I gate this song. I bait this song. I hate this song. It reminds me of Zelda. I want to fuck Zelda. Hard. I hate this song. I want Zelda to fuck me. In Canada, I feel like Scarlett Johansson. I saw Scarlett Johansson in a movie, Lost in Translation. She is sitting against Tokyo's flickering red lights. She thinks she is Asian. I saw her being Japanese in the white version of Ghost in the Shell. In the movie, she was a cyborg. I am a cyborg. Scarlet is not. I am the opposite of Scarlet. I am O3, an Oriental Orientalist from the Orient. I am the cyborg Scarlet plays in Ghost in the Shell. I am actually Japanese. I am walking on the street now. I am listening to a song. I have headphones. Um, 
Um, yeah, so that is, that is all I have. I think I'm over the time, so I'm just going to end here. <laughs> yeah, so we could do questions now. Okay, great. Uh, so Louis has a question. He has the symbol up. How can I see gallery of everyone? Oh, yes. I, I don't have a question. I just uh, sent a reaction. Sorry. Oh. Oh. <laughs> I just want to do reaction like this. <laughs> very, very uh, intriguing and provocative uh, presentation. Um, um, I've seen some work in progress before, and I think that what you've presented seemingly very, very inspiring and provocative. And I believe many people here have a lot of questions inside, and they are articulating, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, please express that you have a question in three different ways. Um, yep, yeah, the club sign, not club sign, design, or um, writing comments. Yeah, so, uh, so Jin Young Kim has a question. Hi. Um, thank you for the presentation. I really, um, yeah, like uh, So Young said, I. Uh, this was a new discovery for me actually <laughs> um, uh, looking into construction of Japanese mm -hmm. identity uh, in the West um, and this idea of internalized Western gaze. Mm -hmm. um, I have a very simple question actually about the film. Um, I, the film is based on the found image. Um, yeah, it's using all stock images and I didn't really mention this but I'm using this um, and this um, Shan, Shanzai, if I'm pronouncing it right, the Chinese deconstruction, um, which is um, the, um, it's, a philo uh, it's a Chinese thought that focuses on the insignificance of the idea of the origin or the authenticity, which is closely linked to the discourse around what constitutes Japanese identity. So um, the use of the stock images kind of mirror that, um, mirror that thought. And also, I had a question about the sound of this automated voice. Um, I guess it's, it reminds us of the Alexa or any other artificial AI sounds um, that gives directions or, you know, mm -hmm. um, but it is, a, it is some kind of an internal monologue right. that these artificial intelligence makes, that, which I thought was really interesting that the artificial intelligence would be looking inwards into their into themselves mm -hmm. <laughs> and then trying to find i don't know like so that was yeah well i guess that was more like a comment i thought that was an interesting sound and then, thank you um Eki has a question right yes uh thank you for your presentation it was uh, amazing and i think it relates to my presentation actually very well and it really informs it um, I did have a question with regards to your um, comparison and use of Donna Haraway's Cyborg Manifesto. Mm -hmm. So Donna Haraway, she talks about cyborg futurities and like using the cyborg as a way to, um, it, I mean, in her context, it was kind of going away from like second world, uh, second wave feminism and like third wave mm -hmm. feminism. So how do you imagine um, using the cyborg um, is like this like cyborg metaphor in relation to Japanese identity in um, like futurities? Right. Um, so the idea of using cyborg to um, explore the idea of Japanese-ness is that so the cyborg, the protagonist, is very confused with the concept of Orientalism that exists in both the West, the Canada, and Japan. And I guess um, um, yeah, I think I wanted to kind of use that as a metaphor to show how nonsensical or how um, these Orientalist um, ideas have no, they're not based off facts or real information, that they're completely nonsensical. So that is like the original idea I had. Thank you. Anyone else has a, um, otherwise, can I just jump in? Um, so yeah, you could jump in. 
the you know the notion of honorary white that when I first learned it, it was shocking as an Asian, um, so to speak, um, subject. And how come? Because it's um, as our forums, so to speak, aim to decolonize um, mm -hmm. ourselves as well as um, the other, you know, the environments uh, where currently we recognizing the so to speak Eurocentric um, uh, power relations as well as discourse productions. The honorary white, the notion which is sl uh, still a uh, quite prevalent uh, in in a very unresolved way in many Japanese mm -hmm. people's mind, um, um, has many problematic connotations. And number one, it naturalizes white supremacy. Number two, uh, the, the something that echoes what I addressed uh, in the last forum, which is again, as you well addressed, internalized. Um, uh, ethnic self-hate um, mm -hmm. as an Asian, which is very ironic in, in many ways. But that was production of 19th century, so to speak, colonial discourses where, where white, dom uh, white dominance or Western dominance was so unavoidable reality. And Japan seemingly um, identified themselves um, through this notion of other in different ways to be able to um, reinvent themselves. Um, but as we know, identification is always very political. Mm -hmm. uh, who you want to identify with. And it's always uh, determined or depends on who you want to wanna be as well as um, um, what you want to achieve in a way. So one of the survey in the earlier slide, uh, you showed that how Japanese people's consciousness, whether they belong to Asia, uh, mm -hmm. or not, and to what extent. Mm -hmm. One of the things what I noticed uh, interesting is that from period of 2003 to five to 2009, what mm -hmm. increased was the Japanese awareness of themselves as a being part of a subset of Asia. So before I'm not Asian, and then there's like little like overlapping, but am I right in reading that? Yeah. yeah. After that, Japan see themselves as a subset of Asia, finally. Mm -hmm. And I wonder um, that it is something to do with, um, again, as I, there is a, it's a pretext when I mentioned that how identification is political. Mm -hmm. It's, so to speak, a rise of uh, Asian economic power as mm -hmm. an entity due to, of course, uh, Chinese liberalization, so to speak, economic liberalization and ascended to the second largest economy in the world. Mm -hmm. So it is, do you see that as also somewhat natural and political, so to speak, shift in Japanese mind to identify themselves as an uh, as Asian because now being surviving, having trade with other Asians, mm -hmm. countries, and of course, not only Chinese, Korean ascendant, ascendance of in terms of the economic and, and cultural power. Do you think that informs, um, so to speak, the shift of, of consciousness? And on that note, uh, I also want to just share uh, Australia have been identified themselves as a part of Asia strategically since late 1990s in the same context, which is very interesting, isn't it? And that mm -hmm. affirmed my thesis how identification is um, utterly political um, enterprises. Yeah. Right. Um, so the survey that I, oh, sorry, that was a lot of, <laughs> um, yeah, the the survey I got the, um, the research that I was looking at, that I got the survey from actually explores how media representation of Japanese, of Asia in Japanese variety shows tolerates with people's identification as Asians or how they see Asia as. And so during that four or five years, um, apparently there were a lot more exposure, positive or more representation of so-called Asian things. Mm -hmm. And apparently so that increased the people's awareness mm -hmm. of them being Asian. Mm -hmm. but, um, okay, perfect, because time is uh, and we're going to have the next presentation. Okay. So the next presenter is uh, Fen Tian Chang. Um, sorry if I mispronounced your name. Uh, they are from uh, Digital Futures at OTAG, and they will be presenting Otaku Media, Anime, Merchandise, 
and consumption. Just sorry to interrupt. Um, if there's any further question, I'm sure you have. We um, during the break, and you, um, I'm, I'm happy to see that you freely engage in conversation, and also at the end of the forum, also, right? So, anyways, thank you. <clears throat> all right, hello everyone. Um, uh, first of all, I want to say, oh, why is it on the slide? Oops. All right, uh, all right. Hello everyone. My name is. Uh, or Thomas, whichever is fine. Um, I have to say that um, one thing I have to say is that um, I changed the title of my presentation. So right now it's uh, Otaku Media Anime's Unique Media Ecosystem and the merchandise that defines it. So uh, my apologies for any confusion. All right, so let's get into this presentation, shall we? So anime is a unique medium that allows for what Mark Steinberg calls a media mix. Uh, this is where a franchise releases interconnecting products for a wide range of media platforms. Uh, in the West, this is more commonly known as what's called a transmedia, where narrative extends beyond multiple types of uh, media like books, movies, and TV, creating a much larger world with multiple characters and plot lines. But what makes anime unique is that this ecosystem is created with commodities. Uh, namely, this relationship between commodities, consumers, and anime itself, uh, coexisting in this mutually beneficial symbiotic relationship. Uh, this emphasis uh, creates um, this creates a heavy emphasis on merchandising and characters to sell and serve as a way to expand the brand's reach. Uh, this is this fundamental. Uh, this this is related to this fundamental relationship between in anime. Uh, between the stillness and commodification. Um, so stillness in anime is basically as old as anime itself. It first began, uh, this is because anime first began as adaptation of manga um, and due to essentially a lower budget, it had no choice but to rely on uh, limited animations and static backgrounds. Um, but this actually instead became advantage by being the principal aspect of animation, something which allowed it to put an emphasis on characters and poses. Uh, this allowed anime to better merchandise itself as the characters would exist beyond an just anime uh, by connecting to both manga and merchandise. Uh, this commodification, this led to commodification based on iconic poses of characters, allowing for easier identification of the character and the continuation of said character into a wider media ecosystem. Uh, this replication of the character through poses means that the characters themselves are merchandise. They embody a brand, the very thing that becomes sold, expanding the universe of a franchise, extending the visual viewing pleasure into other mediums. This diffuses anime into a transmedia experiment, experience, which generates income for studios to cover the weekly episodes, creating a basic cycle of how anime operates to this day. As, meaning stillness becomes an advantage as character and content can freely flow across media within an ecosystem. As the anime industry develops, this ecosystem is expanded through supporting media like magazines and communities, leading to an ever expanding cycle of consumption between the viewing experience to purchase and generate income. Uh, this becomes something that studios take note of and incorporate going forward. And this becomes one of the biggest hallmark of anime, which I call parallel media. This emphasis around communities and goods leads to this unique native uh, ecosystem that's different from the more narrative based transmedia experiences, uh, which we are more used to in the West. As I see it, uh, transmedia works uh, belong to one of these two different styles, being parallel or serial. Is everyone okay? Thank you, Kathy. Yeah, okay. So why don't we uh, proceed again, the part file share, please. Uh, share screen, uh, Thomas, you can continue, please. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right, I'll do fine where I was before. Um, yeah, so, yeah, so the, so the difference between uh, Japanese media mix and Western uh, transmedia is 
the difference in what I call parallel media and serial media. So parallel media, uh, being anime, for example, focuses on fan interaction. It focuses on material objects, something that's physical, um, and creates these things called uh, framework narratives, where the world sort of exists as something that people can tell stories with, uh, focusing on anime fan content uh, in the form of, say, doujinshi, which is this, um, it's basically self pub. It, it's basically Japanese for self-published works. Um, but I guess the closest analogy to the West would be like fan fiction. Um, the thing that makes it really different, however, is that uh, these are something that is bought and sold, right? It's something that, it's something that is uh, both creative and derivative that is kind of essential part to this ecosystem. Uh, while serial media uh, has a much bigger focuses, focus on canon narratives, narratives that are sort of official by the franchise producer, something that sort of connects uh, all the content together through familiar characters, stuff like that. So next, all right. So a good example of this uh, parallel media idea would be Gundam Plastic Model Kits or Gunpla. Uh, so this is basically merchandise that is sold by the people who own the franchise. Right? It's sold by Bandai who own Gundam. And this sort of thing uh, brings reality to the merchandise by, bringing, uh, by making anime, by being a physical manifestation of ideas and themes, which allow for creative creativity within derivative media. Uh, and this is expanded through things like GBWC or Gundam Builders World Cup, which is an international competition sponsored by Bandai, uh, with, uh, which includes 16 countries, uh, including Canada, actually. Uh, and this competition sort of reinforces this idea of creativity and derivativity uh, within plastic, within parallel media, allowing for fans to use the merchandise of the franchise uh, in any way they want, with judging based on individual craftsmanship, painting, and concept uh, as individual creative works, um, which shows how creative uh, parallel media shows like Gundam create an emphasis on the content and merchandise around the narrative by giving the tools for fans to do what they want with it. Um, this also leads to things like merchandise anime, where, you know, the content of the merchandise is, some, is something that is so popular, so official and mainstream that uh, they actually create shows which are essentially advertisements for the merchandise itself. Uh, shows like Gundam Build Fighters, uh, which contain a lot of in-universe references and universe gags aimed for a core audience. Um, while the show itself is light, the sort of idea of an emphasis on sort of making fans interact with content is the topic of the next part of the presentation, uh, which I call media cannibalism, which is, which is the intensification of collection of goods and the basis of otaku culture, a trend towards more exploitation of characters through sex appeal and, and generating income. Uh, and this sort of idea relies on what is the otaku, uh, the otaku subculture. Uh, this openness of parallel media, allowing for growth of consumer audiences, uh, is something that becomes more increasingly promoted within circles of interest and accompanying merchandise to consume a cycle of relations between consumption of anime to purchasing, uh, purchasing merchandise and generating income for studios um, for what's called otaku culture. So I think in the West, uh, this term otaku is something that is um, something that's kind of neutral or positive. But um, in Japan, this term is more for someone who is like obsessive to the point of being antisocial, um, someone who, you know, collects goods and ignore everyday life, um, someone who Yeah, someone who is so obsessed with media. Um, and the collection of the goods that media produces. Uh, and this leads to media cannibalism, a situation where anime and manga create a media ecosystem with tropes, stories, and characters repeated across various shows and becomes incredibly self-referential in nature. Uh, these tropes are repeated to a new otaku audience 
who become animators and repeat the cycle, uh, but without any nuance of original context uh, behind the original ideas. Um, or for the sake of creating animes with you know pre-existing gags that are pre-established uh, with very little care of the actual characters themselves uh, as they become more exploited through merchandising and profit. Uh, this creates this very ambivalent story where they try to tell these genuine stories of you know with characters and plots that are strong, but at the same time this the genuine care of telling stories is um, this genuine care of telling stories is replaced by having characters who are also nothing but commodities. Um, so what happens is that derivative ideas becomes what derivative ideas become what is being what sells uh, these tropes and these tropes and trends, uh, these tropes and trends across all media. I create this certain sort of environment where the only things that become popular and become common are the things that sell. So right now, one of the biggest trends in anime is isekai. Uh, these are adaptations of, these are generally adaptations of light novel and isekai is basically this uh, trope where a character becomes reincarnated in another world. Um, this is something that is just incredibly common in anime. Uh, these uh, these these things are something that really makes it hard for anime to actually genuinely innovate uh, because what happens is that there is less and less care about these stories and more and more care about actually generating income. Uh, so an example of this is having merchandise that is that tries to exploit the characters. Uh, these things are body pillows or dakimakura, uh, where characters are are on this, you know, gigantic, uh, gigantic pillow that's life size. Um, and sometimes they're in these very suggestive poses. Um, another thing is character design becomes something that's exploited. Uh, so for example, in the show Steins Gate, um, which first aired in 2011, uh, this is quite a popular anime on my anime list, which is a, a community website for people who want to, you know, uh, rank what anime they like or say what anime they watch. Uh, this is the second most popular with some millions of people who like this show. Uh, but still, with this, with this much popularity, there's still this uh, sort of need to increasing to increase the sexualization of. Uh, certain female characters. Uh, in this example is Suzuha in the 2018 Sign Gate Zero, which is not really a sequel. It basically is like a continuation of a side story within the main story. Uh, you, you can see that like the thing that they care about the most is the bus size of this character. Um, and this also extends to the actual physical merchandise. Uh, even you know, old shows like Zeta Gundam from 1985, you still have this want to sexualize these female characters. So on the left, you have uh, Haman Karn, and on the right is Quattro Bajina. So both these characters are from the same show. Um, and you can see that like with the male character, uh, you see this sort of mimetic ability to reflect the, you know, tightness of his clothing. Uh, but for the female character, they, they completely amp this up, right? Uh, Haman's Karn on the left, her face is sort of changed from this sort of um, sharpness, becomes more soft. Uh, her clothes are extremely tight to the point you can see her belly button. Uh, even her heels are much taller than they were before. Um, and what also happens is sort of these, anim um, these scenes and ideas from anime itself becomes repli become replicated from uh, across different new anime. Uh, so for example, in Neon Genesis Evangelion, uh, you have this really famous scene of in this elevator that sort of highlights the awkwardness and silence between these two characters. Um, and it's just something that's just constantly referred to and reflected across all other Japanese um, media. 
And what this all leads to is an environment where uh, merchandise basically becomes essential to anime survival, where it feeds into an increasingly obsessive fan base. And this fan base gives back to the industry in a form of income and, and fan generated stories, uh, reinforcing ex existing tropes and trends within the story uh, without any pre existing critique or nuance. And these shows and stories of characters exist to be exploited to generate income, uh, creating this strong ambivalence between actual story and the intent of commercialization, uh, which all brings back to the idea of media, media cannibalism, a self-consuming cycle of exploitation for profit, focus on merchandising, feeding back into otaku culture, uh, which then leads, to, which ultimately leads to uh, this idea of tropes and stories being taken up by the next generation of animators, regurgitating this sort of experience within the medium itself, uh, while ideas of these trends will rise and fall. These tropes are a groundwork of this culture, this self-referential cannibalistic approach to media consumption with the exploitation of two-dimensional characters for profit and tropes without context and critique over time. Um, and this uh, concludes my, uh, my presentation. Yes. So I guess we could do questions now. Thanks. So Does anyone have any questions? Thanks a lot. Um, um, I hope that um, that those who are feeling a little offended and stressed after the uh, incidents and well, I've been imagining this situation. I read too many articles, so I'm not as affected. But yes, quite affected. But I'm not uh, as. But get us some rest. But uh, um, I will find a security measure how to. Um, I thought that I actually set those uh, limits that while somebody else is speaking, no one else can alter the screen. Is what I believe the set that it didn't work. So I'm going to double check that. But Let's have a, uh, yeah, there's um, question times, please. Um, who has a question, please? So all the part, we have a lot of uh, Japan-focused uh, cultural explorations and culture industry and question of cyborg and identity and everything. Yeah. Questions, please. So I think Angelina, can Gota is raising their hands. Yes, Angelina, yeah. Uh, so you mentioned, or yeah, Angelina, sorry, I believe that there was some type of, my name's Angelina and I'm here in Toronto right now. Uh, pardon me. <laughs> so you mentioned these tropes and these archetypes that seem to carry through anime. Uh, I have seen you on Genesis Evangelion and I love it. So I do think some of these tropes, like obviously not the sexualized ones, do you see some of, these tropes as positive tropes and also do you have any anime that you'd recommend that's innovative that's being released now because those things i know like a few of the animes i really like happen to be from the 90s are those tropes continuing on and are there people breaking these tropes yeah that's a good question um because the thing about uh, neon genesis evangelion itself is that it's sort of established these tropes in the first place um and it it, it does seem very hard to break from from these sort of ideas because you know as uh, we sort of have people raised on media itself they sort of bring what they know back into it uh, as for shows that sort of try to break all those things um i think i think well i can't really think off the top of my head of some things that try to break the trolls but i do know that um anime recently anime in general as an industry have recently been looking towards uh, new and different types of media content to adopt from. So a good example would be uh, stuff like Tower of God, which is from a Korean manhua webcomic. Um, that sort of brings new life and new innovation into what is already sort of this like internal closed ecosystem, uh, brings new ideas and stuff like that, yeah. Do you find that there, are, okay, so one example I would like to say is One Punch Man kind of breaks a fourth wall with anime. Are there any other animes that you believe do that because what one punch man does is kind of satirizes the hero genre with having one character that is like the be all end all like his one punch kills everything so it makes a mockery out of everything but do you like so example in western media i guess would be like scream 
the horror movie kind of reinvented the genre because it broke the fourth wall because all the characters kind of realize they're in a movie and make fun of the tropes that they believe they're going to fall into. So I guess, yeah. Do we see a lot of fourth wall breaking starting to emerge or is that something that's yet to come? Um, so, well, I don't think it's necessary like a fourth wall break. I think that sometimes that they sort of innovate on the tropes and genres. So for example, with Isekai, right? You have um, stuff like Sword Art Online, which is like sort of the first uh, mainstream Isekai anime. But then you have stuff like, uh, you have, stuff like um, ReZero, which is like isekai, but also suffering, right? Um, but, and there's also stuff like Recreators, which is an isekai, but instead of, you know, characters going into this fictional world, you have these fictional characters coming to uh, real life, which sort of play with the ideas of uh, this genre. Um, and you sort of see this coming nowadays because of um, how sort of how stale the isekai genre itself is. You sort of see these more inventive stories being told because now they can actually experiment because the genre is so successful, they can, you know, just adapt whatever, right? Thank you. I'm just curious, um, um, how many of you grew up with, or would you describe yourself as uh, um, what to say, manga or anime lovers of apps, you know, you've read if, uh, sufficient amount of <laughs> manga and anime. Raise your hands. All right, yes, yeah, a lot of because at our Orchid University's art and design school, we have a huge uh, number of uh, manga and anime lovers who actually become artists and designer because of their childhood memory of loving manga and anime, actually. So, um, Yep. Um, let's invite one more question, please. Yeah. Uh, may I ask a question? Sure. Yeah, you can. Yep. Hi, uh, Thomas. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I just want to uh, ask one question. Uh, you must know this uh, term called weeaboo, which describes uh, people who's originally not Japanese, uh, very intensely interested in Japanese culture, especially in the ACG. Uh, in anime, uh, manga, and game world, uh, that they would go to the point to deny their own uh, original, uh, let's say, natural identity and force themselves to identify as Japanese. Um, this goes, I think it, it, there might be something interesting uh, that is correlated between this continual uh, trend to commodify um, anime and this uh, world culture that is currently currently uh, orienting towards, uh, you know, watching Japanese anime. So do you see any uh, correlation between the commodification of anime and the weeaboo culture uh, being growing uh, in, in the in internet? Yeah, so um, I guess I guess weeaboo is a very like Western centric. Um, I guess it's sort of like a subculture of otaku subculture where it's sort of this Western centric idea of like trying to just love Japanese things because they love this one Japanese, you know, this Japanese industry of anime and manga. Um, it's sort of it's sort of kind of strange and um, sometimes. Uh, I know that in the Western anime um, community, there's a lot of very like self-deprecating and these sort of uh, interesting like phrases and terms and like these, yeah, and things that get popular. And it's sort of uh, very strange because it's sort of just like weird reflection of, of like orientalizing this, um, these like Japanese, things but at the same time it's like this just love and consumerism of it yeah I, I'm, not, I'm not like um that in depth to into like weeaboo culture so I hope my answer is satisfactory sorry I don't thank you for your input can I just jump in um I have a, yeah I actually uh been introduced this term we, weebu is it? We have, we, weebu is the term, isn't it? Yeah, so I actually found the term, the creation of this kind of, so to speak, fandom um, is fascinating at the same time how it has been um, um, used uh, in, with a negative connotation. And I agree with Thomas's, um, so to speak, um, response that 
this is the form of also, um, so to speak, Western centric um, way of authorizing a group of people which is part of themselves, but who seemingly very much into the culture entity that they don't know of. So um, um, it is a quite uh, interesting phenomenon. Uh, however, any time it's a cross culturally, cross, cross culturally interesting phenomenon and phenomenon of, of otherizations and undermining uh, those love. And I have noticed that also a new term has created, which is a Korea boo or something. Those who are now into where is the sound of. Who is responsible for the sounds of breaking dishes? Raise your hands. Anyone? Because I heard a strange man's voice while uh, Thomas, uh, Thomas was presenting. Anyone? I should learn. I think, I think the man's voice comes from Thomas's own mic. Oh, I see. And, and there's some people, uh, some noises that dishes was breaking in the, in the background. So if you're, if you're responsible for that, could you please take care of it during the break? <laughs> um, uh, but what is ultimately nature of this type of uh, term? Well, um, once you're, uh, let's say, become interested in um, uh, the culture which is other than uh, yourself, of course, it is based on certain attachment that you have uh, developed. And the attachment cannot be grown without um, um, understanding of, of the culture then the understanding becomes something very disproportionate that you become suddenly, um, so to speak, um, ostracized by your friends in high school that why, what you're talking about, those Japanese names or Korean names that they never heard. And xenophobia is of course underlying um, sentiment that underpin this type of, uh, so to speak, um, negative uh, terms that invented for lover of, of uh, other culture. But one thing that is also um, uh, common that we need to address is that, uh, so to speak, this kind of love of other culture is always involved in certain romanticization and fetishistic relations. So if it is not the fet unhealthy fetishism of the other without um, sufficient um, knowledge, um, any any type of fandom which based on fetishization of the object is dangerous. Whether you are a believer, the believer is the one who loves Justin Bieber unconditionally. So um, there is no differences in terms of fandom can go very wrong. And so, anyways, I just wanted to universalize this fandom culture and how they can be, so to speak, um, regarded as an odd and strange by those who are non, uh, not part of that, yeah.